Hey drinking buddies, the Taste of Japan is back. This amazing Japanese street food fair is going to be at 10 Mile Brewing in Signal Hill on Labor Day weekend. Pre-order your favorite 10 Mile craft beers, snacks from Drinking Buddy, freshly grilled yakitori, savory takoyaki and tonkatsu, and much, much more. It's all available for pickup on Sunday, September 6th from 4 to 7 p.m. This event is pre-order only and almost sold out, so you need to move now. Head to www.tasteofjpn.com and click on pre-order now. We'll see you at 10 Mile this Labor Day weekend. We wanted to stand in front of people as two white guys to say, this is Japanese. We did our due diligence. We spent time in Japan and it's really worked out well. This is the Drinking Buddy Show, where we explore food, craft, beverage pairings, and the entrepreneurs and tastemakers behind them. I'm Frank, founder of Drinking Buddy Artisan Snacks. On today's show, I'll be chatting with Billy Melnick, the visionary behind Soto Sake. We'll chat about his lifelong love of beverages, music, travel, fine dining, and what led him to leaving a dream career at Bacardi to launch a global sake brand. Billy got his start in the world of bars and beverages very early on in life. A natural entrepreneur, he also started a side hustle while working a part-time job at a pizza restaurant. This would lead to work in film, nightclubs, and eventually a career with Bacardi in Miami. Through it all, Billy maintained a connection with Japanese cuisine and sake, leading to his launch of Soto Sake. Yeah, so my name is Billy Melnick, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Soto Sake, a Japanese sake brand that we launched in 2015 in the U.S. We've now expanded to multiple international markets and we're available across uh, the U.S. and in Ontario, in Canada. And then I'm a marketing executive and an investor, and I've been involved in some packaged goods brands. I formerly worked at Bacardi for over 10 years, so worked on some very famous spirits brands. And um, I have a little investment fund with a couple of friends, and I'm involved in you know, a Japanese juice company, a water brand called Flow, and some other companies that I've been involved with over the past 10 years. I grew up in hospitality, and I was always around restaurants. One of my good friends, his family was really the impresario of the bar scene in my hometown of Ottawa, Canada. Around 13, 14, I was helping my friend out with a liquor order. So his parents owned this crazy nightclub and he would get me to help him out. We'd skateboard all day and then head over and do the liquor order. So we were processing the order, restocking the bars. Obviously, we weren't there at night when it was open because we were underage. But being in there doing the inventory and learning the costs was my first introduction to that industry. Very exciting. And then the other thing that was cool is I was touching all these liquor bottles, you know, Seagram's at the time and Bacardi Rum and reading the labels as we were stocking the shelves and, and in the liquor room. And I started to learn about cocktails and, you know, where Southern Comfort was from and how it was made and really the history of wine and spirits. It was pretty exciting. And at the same time, I was working at a little pizza place and the pizza place, people would sometimes come in and want chili flakes or chili peppers. And I had the idea of starting a spicy oil company to sell bottles of oil. So while okay. I was doing the liquor order, I would take the empty bottles, scrape off the labels, fill them with olive oil, chili peppers, make my own spicy oils, and then sell them for $20. So <laughs> that was one of my forays into entrepreneurship, but I was making some cash on the side and, the, and a little side hustle. And then I ended up working at restaurants, you know, bar backing, turn into bartender. And in Canada, you can work in bars when you're 18. The legal drinking age where I was from at the time was 19. And in the US, obviously 21. So I was really young in that realm and started to learn pretty young how to, how to make some pretty cool cocktails. Billy shares how film informed the rest of his career. I was always involved in creative projects, so I'm a big, uh, what people call now like a stack file, so I was a big magazine collector. And I grew up, as I said, skateboarding, so skateboarding, BMX racing, which obviously, you know, I was a kid in Canada, so the only way to live California was through these incredible magazines that came out once a month that I get at 7-Eleven. And a lot of skateboarders got really into graphic design and art. Um, because of those logos and the design. So that was really my realm on a creative process. Got it a little bit into graffiti culture. Then as I started to go to university, I was really interested in film and studied film theory. Where I came from in Ottawa, there was an incredible film theory program at Carleton University. 
And what I realized is, you know, as a young kid, I was writing stories, wrote a lot of short stories, published some short stories. And I realized that filmmaking was really storytelling. And now when I look at it, you know, as a marketer, brand marketing is all about storytelling. And I think it's more important than ever. Brands need to have great stories. They need to be authentic. And consumers these days, when they pick up a product, they're reading the label, they're going to the website, they want to know where something was made, where it's from, what it's all about. So I think there's a great parallel between film theory. I then got into production, made a few films, turned short stories that I'd written into film. And parallel path to that, I opened a nightclub and running the nightclub as I was finishing my film school, kind of similar, running a team of 30, 40 people was just like being on a film set. So it definitely helped as a crossover and found that there's some incredible parallels between the two for sure. Billy shares his first experiences with Japanese sake and cuisine. Yeah, I was introduced to sake pretty early. One of my friends was actually a chef at a Japanese restaurant. So I'd go by to see what he was up to. And he was very specific about where he was getting his fish from and the sake that he was buying. So I learned a bit about sake. Like most North Americans, I tried a lot of sake hot at the mm -hmm. beginning. I had a girl at a local Japanese place. She was actually from Osaka and said, guys, 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 you got to try sake cold. Here's some premium stuff from my hometown. She introduced us to other sake and I developed a great palate to it that stage. And I've always been connected to Asian cultures, food, design, architecture. And I've been fortunate to travel extensively with my role working on some of the world's best known spirit brands. So with Bacardi, I traveled a lot. And all these cities I was going to, you know, Paris, London, Milan, Copenhagen, New York, the best food that I wanted to check out, although it's fun to have local food, I always ended up at a Japanese restaurant and started to see that there was this incredible growth, the Japanese culinary scene globally. Then actually I moved to Miami. Bacardi took me from a terrible snowstorm one year. I moved from minus 30 degree temperatures in Toronto and I moved to Miami to work with the Bacardi company. And I lived actually next to Zuma. So Zuma became my local bar. And from there, you know, they have 250 sakes on the menu. So I was really fortunate to not only be next to an incredible restaurant, but to learn a lot about sake from that experience as well. When we return, Billy shares how he met his partner, Dan Rubinoff. Thanks for listening so far. If you enjoy the show, be sure to subscribe and leave us a review. Then head to www.thedrinkingbuddyshop.com and pick up some tasty pub snacks, barware, and more. Every purchase he makes helps us support small family-owned businesses in rural Japan and bring you more delicious, unique snacks to pair with your favorite beverages. Special thanks to all of you that have already started enjoying our snacks and sharing them with your buddies. So Dan and I have been long standing friends. I owned a nightclub in Ottawa and with a partner, Nicholas Richenbach and Dan and Nicholas were friends. So Dan came to visit in 2000, actually, no, it was earlier than that, 1998, 1999. Dan was living in Toronto, came to visit and we became good friends. We worked on a few startup projects together. Fortunately, with my work at Bacardi, I was traveling quite a bit. Dan's an avid traveler and uh, has invested in real estate in Costa Rica, went down to Buenos Aires. So always meeting in different cities, which has been exciting. And when I had the idea for launching a Japanese sake, I called Dan first and I said, it's time to get on a plane, get in the game and let's head to Tokyo and see if there's really a business opportunity here. So that's been really exciting. And you know, as partners, we balance each other extremely well. He has a, an economics background and really strong with negotiation and real estate. But um, he also jumped into Buenos Aires, learned, you know, the language, the culture very quickly. So I knew that going to Japan, he was a great guy to have at my side to deal with the incredible culture of doing business in Japan. Billy shares his impression of the Japanese business culture. Really interesting. I think you hear about it. You can read about how to do business, you know, meshy, the style of exchanging business cards and, and incredible culture of how to take care of yourself and wearing slippers and taking off your shoes at the door. I mean, we're, we're a couple Canadian guys, so already we're pretty polite and, and responsive. 
truthfully going to Japan, traveling through the country, a lot of breweries that we went with are people in the sake industry, a little bit of hesitation in working with Americans. When they found out we were Canadian, a little more responsive in inviting us in for tea, for example. So a little strange from that perspective, culturally. And then, you know, we went all over Japan and ended up in the countryside in some areas where not that many people from Canada have ever been. And the culture is definitely unique. Tokyo is the sprawling metropolis, really exciting, lots of things to do, lots of expats there now, but still less from a percentage than any other major city around the world. So it's a little different. And I know you do business in Japan as well, as you've seen it. It's a challenge. But it's all about respect. And once you spend the time and the energy and the support and extend your hand and drink tea with them, you start to develop these incredible lifelong relationships. I think with the things that I've done in my life, it's all built on relationships, taking care of good contacts and ensuring that it's not about the short term. So, you know, I learned that in negotiation. You want to make sure that both sides are happy, but... You want to work with great people for a very long time, not just for the short term. Doing business in Japan, it's taught us that even more so. It's a country where a lot of times they don't want to do contracts. You know, we're so used to signing contracts in the U.S. and doing things quick. And there, it definitely takes more time. It's more about respect and about showing up as well. So even though we all have phones and we can use Zoom these days, Nothing beats being in Japan face-to-face, and it's something that's really important with our Japanese uh, vendors and friends. Doing business, you sit in front of each other, and honestly, that's why sake is thriving and always has. It's what I call the world's oldest bottle service. You put a bottle of sake on a table with small ochokos, the little sake cups, and you're pouring for each other, engaging with each other, getting to know each other. There's nothing better than doing that in, in that environment at a cute little restaurant in Japan, for sure. Billy shares his thought process behind the Soto Sake brand. So I grew up at a time, I, I owned a nightclub in Ottawa. I had gone through this whole transition. Like most people, I was really attracted to a brand called Absolute Vodka. And Absolute Vodka had these incredible ads that I used to see in in magazines. I used to rip them out and save them. So when I started working at Bacardi, Bacardi bought the brand Grey Goose Vodka from Sydney Frank. What's interesting, and I consider it a parallel, vodka was the poor man's drink back in the 50s, 60s, 70s in North America. It was sold in a brown paper bag. It was on the bottom shelf. And uh, when Absolute came out, the advertising is what really pushed that forward. And when you think about it, the Swedish government was involved in a vodka brand that propelled around the world. Sidney Frank launched Grey Goose. He was in Cognac, you know, working with a winemaker, a Cognac guy who also made a vodka, saw a little Grey Geese running across the field. But what's interesting at the time, he brought over these incredible bottles and in, in wine crates, promoted them to celebrities and at charity events around golf and put ads in, uh, in newspapers, the Wall Street Journal and charged twice as much as absolute and people thought he was crazy you know and all of a sudden if you look back you know 10 years ago 25 percent of alcohol sold in the united states was vodka so i was watching that happen and i thought this is incredible and then this incredible parallel to sake it is a beverage that i was enjoying myself bacardi was not involved in any japanese products and, and not involved in sake But I found myself going to Asian fusion restaurants, Japanese restaurants, obviously drinking Grey Goose vodka and promoting the brands that I was working on. But this incredible affinity developed for sake and the way that it paired nicely with food. And I talked to the Bacardi company about sake and about Japan, and there wasn't really an interest at that time. And I thought, wow, this is a fast growing category. I started to look at some data obviously for the brands that I was touching, but also for sake and and for shochu and some other brands that Bacardi was not involved in. And at one point I saw growth of 36% for premium sake. So a fast growing category, growing year over year, no leading brand. And the main challenge is that no one could pronounce the name. So back to my vodka story back in the day, what were the vodka brands? Stolichnaya, Musklovaya, no one could pronounce them until someone put a brand called Absolute and pushed it with an ad campaign. 
So I thought sake bottles, predominantly Japanese, it's very hard to go to a Japanese restaurant, enjoy a bottle of sake, take a photo of the kanji, go to a liquor store the next day and have the guy behind the counter know what it is that you put in into your mouth the night before. So I thought this is an incredible opportunity in a category that I adore. I knocked Dan and I said, hey, let's get on a plane and let's, let's sort this thing out. At the same time, what was happening with me is I was traveling extensively. Great, great job. I had an incredible life. Lots of fun, lots of nights out, nightlife, restaurants. But I was feeling a little bit run down and sick. And I went to a doctor and it turned out I had the onset of liver disease. I had a really fatty liver. I didn't drink alcohol till I was in my early 20s. I worked in that industry, but I actually didn't drink. Then I drank a lot. And then working at the Bacardi company, you know, doing sampling during the day, team meetings, going out to nightclubs, definitely the one out the latest because I was looking after a lot of the bottle service and nightlife. So the nutritionist obviously said, hey, the first thing you got to do is quit drinking. And then jokingly, she said, I know you're not going to quit drinking, but you should go to lower alcohol by volume, you know, maybe a bit of white wine. Have you ever thought of drinking sake? And I said, I love sake. Why do you recommend sake? And she said, well, it's all natural, lower alcohol by volume. And she said, it's made from koji, which is a naturally occurring mold. So it's actually good for your digestive system, kind of like a kombucha. I recommend if you drink anything, you know, look towards looking at some of the sake bottles. And I thought, wow, I was just thinking about this as a business concept. And now you're telling me that there's a health benefit to it. This is unbelievable. So that was the extent of it. And, and then I told Bacardi, I said, hey, it's time for me to leave. I want to go do my own thing. And they were incredibly supportive. And a few of my other colleagues had left Bacardi to launch their own rum brands or tequila brands. So there's a, an entrepreneurial culture that came out of that company and a lot of great brands now are actually run by alumni from Bacardi globally. Billy shares the impact of health and wellness on Soto Sake. You know, health and wellness is at the forefront of food and beverage presently. It's definitely not a fad. It's not going away. It's a trend. I think even now as people are very conscious about cooking at home and what they're buying, even more so, I think that we're extremely well positioned. It's a category that's exciting. A lot of sake is gluten-free, but it doesn't say so on the label, probably about 30%. We were able to make Japanese sake that is all natural, gluten-free, no additives, no preservatives, no added sugar, and no sulfites. So as people are looking to what we call drink healthier or healthy-ish, turning against some of the ready-to-drink beverages that could be full of sugar, or some of the spirits as people find out that there's quite a bit of calories in some of the products. It's a great alternative. And just sake being lighter, you know, enjoying your food, not getting smashed at lunch, drinking and eating lighter, I think is here to stay for sure. Billy talks about why he opted to work with Atoji in Japan. I think for us, we know that there's some incredible American producers and some breweries. There's some out in Oregon. California. There's an incredible brewery now in Brooklyn called Brooklyn Kura. They're making fantastic, fantastic sake. And there's Japanese rice strains being grown over in the U.S. For us, we really saw a story and an authenticity in working with all Japanese vendors. So first and foremost, the brewery, the bottling, the rice, we wanted everything to be from Japan and also being two white guys from Canada, we felt that not only did we have to educate ourselves because we were going to be questioned. I learned that very much from working at Bacardi and, and I worked on the advocacy team that was focused on education. A lot of bartenders would challenge the authenticity of brands and how they were made in the production process. So I needed to make sure that we were fully aware. We studied extensively sake. Dan has done extensive courses on sake production and has an expansive knowledge. And for me, I also studied the SPC course with John Gautner and I took the level two class as well. And we wanted to make sure that we were well-educated and we thought that the best thing we could do to present sake to a North American audience and eventually a global audience was to make sure that everything was from Japan. Niigata is known as a key sake region, tons and tons and tons of snow which obviously generates a lot of water. It makes very, very soft water, 
and Niigata is also well known for the rice. The rice that we use in both sakes is gohiyaki mangoku. It's a rice that's a little bit bigger and very tasty and has a nice mouthfeel. So options, you know, there's incredible glass coming out of France and Italy to make great bottles. There's cheaper glass from Mexico that's very well made. But from a simplicity too, it's much easier to buy bottles from a Japanese manufacturer. And interestingly, when we were creating the Jumai de Genjo packaging, Joe Doucette is the designer we we're working with. We we're trying to finish the bottle with something special. And we found ourselves looking at fabrics from Japan. And, and Japan obviously has an incredible textile industry. And I remember when I was a kid, I saved up to buy these Avizu jeans, these incredible Japanese denim. I told Joe, I said, man, maybe we should do denim. And he said, you're crazy. It's way too expensive. But we ended up finding a denim company that would make these little squares for us that are the toppers on our Jumai Daigenjo bottles. So they act in, in a wabi-sabi realm. So glass bottle, hard surface, very hard, but putting the fabric on it adds a different texture. In Japan, all these things are in balance. You know, wabi-sabi is about everything being in balance. That's why wood chopsticks sit on the ceramic holder, for example. There was something about putting the Japanese denim on the top that really finished the bottle. So for us, we wanted to stand in front of people as two white guys to say, this is Japanese, this is Japanese, this is Japanese. We did our due diligence. We spent time in Japan and it's really worked out well. And truthfully, my big concern, we started selling in New York. I thought, you know, I had a backpack on and a bunch of bottles doing self-distribution, walking into these restaurants. We had a lot of great friends in the industry. But going to see Japanese chefs like uh, Hirohisa, for example, Michelin star chef, I was very concerned. I don't speak the language very well. I know a few words in, in Japanese, but once they looked at the bottle, truthfully, they realized it was from Niigata. They were willing to taste. And once they tasted, they were like, wow, this is an amazing sake. And we got distribution in some of the finest Japanese high-end restaurants in New York and then across the United States. And fortunately, we were able to bring sake to a lot of non-Asian, non-Japanese restaurants. And after our first year, over 50% of our sales were going to non-Asian, non-Japanese accounts. So truthfully, recruiting new consumers and bringing sake to a lot of new people. So we gained a lot of respect in the industry and also from the brewery and the toji for the way that we were taking care of the sake. And that's worked out really well. The first offering from Soto Sake was a Junmai Dai Ginjo. Billy shares why. Like a lot of people getting into sake, to learn about it, one thing you would do, just like you would with wine most likely, or scotch for example, you would think that the most expensive stuff is the best stuff. So being uneducated at the onset, and like I said, going from hot sake to chilled, Entering Jumai Dai Ginjo as a category, they're easier to drink, they're more expensive, you think they're higher quality. And truthfully, I was the Grey Goose guy selling a super premium vodka. So I thought from a marketing perspective, the Jumai Dai Ginjo must be the best type of sake. So Jumai Dai Ginjo means that the rice is milled or washed down to 50% at least. So it, it's half the size of the rice as when it started, and there's no alcohol added in the production process. Some of the rice is milled even smaller. Some brands are down to 7%. I've even heard of one that's at 2%. Obviously, if you're milling the rice down 50%, you need twice as much rice to make the sake. That's why it's more expensive. There's labor included, but rice is quite expensive, and it's the main ingredient in sake making along with water. So we thought from a marketing perspective, introducing North Americans like myself, and I've always learned that if I'm marketing something to me, and I have a lot of friends that do the same things that I do. We're going to do well in sales. So we wanted to launch with something that was super premium and really jump into the category with a brand at that categorization. Around that time when we were in development, I started to drink way more Jumai, even on Jozo. So lesser quality, less expensive sake, still premium. But I really started to enjoy earthier sakes, mushroomy sakes and there's been an explosion of creativity and innovation with some of the younger sake makers a lot of kids have gone to agriculture school in japan and 
maybe 10, 20 years ago, it wasn't cool to follow your father's footstep or your grandfather and be a Toji. But now there's a turn towards doing things for the country and for Japan. Uh, really, since Fukushima, there's been this incredible pride in Japanese products from the Japanese. So a lot of people went back into sake making, studied, and there's a lot of innovation happening. So long story short, I've had a lot of different sake types. And with Soto, what's exciting is, you know, we launched a Jumai now, which I think is just delicious. It's clean, fresh aromatics. Apple has a bit of nougat, incredible taste, different from our Jumai that Genjo pairs nicely with all types of food, a little bit of umami. And the future is at hold. We can do a lot of different things across the sake category. Billy shares some tips on traveling and visiting Tokyo. So this is what's interesting. I probably, I have a little city list for every city I've been to and cool places I've been. So a lot of friends will lean on me and, and as I've done as well with them to say, hey, I'm going to this city. What do you think? Tokyo is a mystery. And truthfully, I could list out three or four places that I went to two years ago and they may not be open or that chef may have changed locations. It's honestly an ever-changing metropolis. So First and foremost, if you ever want to hit me up on my Instagram, I'll give any recommendations for places I've been to recently. But my recommendation with Tokyo especially is just what I call open doors. You got to step outside your comfort zone, see what's behind that door that you're looking at. And the best way is to really just hit the streets and see what's out there. Some of the really amazing Michelin star hype restaurants in Japan Sometimes you need to book them three, six months, some of them even a year in advance. The crazy thing about Tokyo, a lot of the restaurants are eight seats or 10 seats. You book far in advance. They know you're coming. They will buy the fish that morning, understanding who's coming and who's showing up. A lot of people and tourists, they go there and and they don't realize that. So they might have had a bad flight and they need to rest. And they're like, oh, I'll just cancel my reservation. You can't really do that. First and foremost, it's terribly impolite. They get offended and they're setting up this experience for you. So some of the hotels offer incredible concierge services to provide recommendations. Some of them will send you to more tourist traps. So it's very challenging. Long story short, you just got to experience it for yourself. But anyone that needs recommendations, I'm always here to help out. Billy shares his personal recommendations for pairing with Soto Sake. I think cocktail is a gateway to enter into the realm of sake. That's exciting. And also for those people that enjoy drinking cocktails, one way to have lower alcohol by volume, make it a healthier cocktail is substitute the vodka or the gin with sake. So we do that in some restaurants we work with in their Bloody Mary. We've made martinis with Soto and it works out really well. I really believe with sake, it's so important to try it straight and chilled. We recommend serving a Soto in a wine glass. It gives you the nuances of the product, lets you see it really well and to taste. Our Jumai da Ginjo is super clean. It's smooth and crisp. It has a bit of apple, cucumber, and melon, so it's really light. I think it pairs so nicely with salads. Obviously, you know, a tuna tartare, sashimi, some sushi, definitely uh, Japanese food. What I found, though, is Dan and I took a class in Japan with an incredible sake owner, Toji chef, who showed us the pairing of sake with non-Japanese foods. So we tried pasta and different elements, and he had us try his sake, and I've tried it since with Soto as well with pizza. And with pizza, especially with the cheese, the tomato sauce, tomato being incredibly umami, When you mix it with sake, you get this incredible flavor explosion in your mouth. The mouthfeel on our Jumai Daginjo is really thick. It's nice. It coats the top of your mouth. Our whole thing is, and John stresses this as well, John Gautner, what I love about the way he presents sake is everything is, it depends. There's not a lot of rules in sake based on the production process. And there's no pairings like there's been for red wine is with meat and white wine is for fish. I think even in the wine world now, there's a sense of discovery. Do what you think is great. And some wine that's not that expensive is absolutely amazing. I think for sake, having no restrictions has really propelled the category forward. So Soto Jumai Daginjo, salads, 
light fishes, definitely with the tuna tartare or sashimi. Our soto jumai, a little ricier in taste, a little more flavorful. I like it. I call it a little bit chunky myself. It's a little more soft rice and clean, fresh aromatics. I would say our jumai, I would try with meats. I actually just had it last night with some French fries and it was unbelievable. I had some fries with a bit of mayonnaise and then we were drinking sake and it, it's just delicious. And we put our soto jumai as well in a can, making it more approachable and accessible. My friends were out yesterday on a boat and they took a bunch of cans with them. So it works for the portability aspect. And they were doing pizza as well. And they said that it was delicious. You know, we've experimented with a few things. Again, I think soto straight, delicious, chilled. Some people are pouring sake over rocks. A little bit of citrus, a lemon rind. We just tried it with jalapeno. Soto jumai da ginjo with, with a jalapeno pepper. Unbelievable. With the citrus by itself, it really opens up the sake, gives it some new flavor. And I find that it changes even with the temperature. I'm a big fan of yuzu. Yuzu is quite expensive. It's a citrus out of Japan. But if you mix soto with yuzu juice, unbelievable. And we've had some restaurants like Q in Miami. They've done a cocktail called No Way Rosé and use sake to create the taste of a rosé wine in a cocktail by using a sake. And we've worked with the Edition Hotel. They've done an incredible sake called Lucy in the Sky. And it was with passion fruit juice cachaca, soto, and um, fresh lemon as well. And that's amazing. So again, I would say experiment. It's very exciting working with sake across cocktails and different food pairings. My favorite thing is soto jumai da ginjo with a little chunk of Parmesan cheese. Just love my cheese, but again, an umami explosion with, with Parmesan, it's amazing. Billy shares some places where you can pick up soto sake. We are available. You can go to our website, sotosake.com. We ship all over the U.S. In Ontario, they can go to lcbo.com, the Liquor Control Board of Ontario. In the U.K., we're on Amazon. So you can go to amazon.co.uk and they ship throughout most of Europe. And then we're in a couple thousand retail stores. We're in Whole Foods, most Whole Foods. And if you don't see us at Whole Foods at your local one, you can ask the manager, they'll bring it in for you. We're at Air One Market, really fine, beautiful grocery store in California and Los Angeles. They have five locations now. Thanks so much to Billy Melnick. You'll be sure to find him in Miami. You don't want to head back to the cold temperatures in Toronto? No, no, I love, uh, I love the sun, that's for sure. You can learn more about Soto Sake by visiting www.sotosake.com. That's S-O-T-O Sake.com. And following them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Soto Sake. Billy is on Instagram at Billy Melnick, M-E-L-N-Y-K. Coming up on The Drinking Buddy Show, I'm chatting with two young beverage entrepreneurs from L.A., Steve and Kevin Wu of Ink Coffee and Craft. We'll learn about their startup, delivering coffee, mocktails, and flavored milk concoctions door-to-door -door as sustainably as possible. Hey, Drinking Buddies, the Taste of Japan is back. This amazing Japanese street food fair is going to be at 10 Mile Brewing in Signal Hill on Labor Day weekend. Pre-order your favorite 10 Mile craft beers, snacks from Drinking Buddy, freshly grilled yakitori, savory takoyaki and tonkatsu, and much, much more. It's all available for pickup on Sunday, September 6th from 4 to 7 p.m. This event is pre-order only and almost sold out, so you need to move now. Head to www.tasteofjpn.com and click on pre-order now. We'll see you at 10 Mile this Labor Day.